Welcome to Friendly Pharmacy 5. My name is Lindsay Dixon. I'm a pharmacist from British Columbia, Canada. And today I have with me Dr. Bonnie Kaplan. Dr. Bonnie Kaplan is the author of this book, The Better Brain. And I recently attended one of her lectures with the Institute for Personalized Therapeutic Nutrition, and it was just mind blowing. So Dr. Kaplan, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, it's my pleasure. Um, I look forward to connecting with more people in the pharmacy world. Dr. Bonnie Kaplan is Professor Emerita from Cummings School of Medicine at the University of Calgary. She has a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology with honors from the University of Chicago, Illinois, a Master's and PhD in Experimental Psychology from Brandeis University, Waltham, Massachusetts, and she is a postdoctoral fellow from West Haven Veterans Hospital and Department of Neurology with Yale University School of Medicine. Dr. Kaplan has published widely on the biological basis of developmental disorders and mental health, particularly the contribution of nutrition to mental health. Her efforts to include nutrition knowledge in the care of people with mental health challenges has earned her a variety of awards, including the Dr. Rogers Prize in September of 2019, selection in 2017 as one of 150 Canadian difference makers in mental health. In 2021, she was chosen as one of the top seven over 70 in Calgary, partly for her book, The Better Brain, written with Professor Julia Rucklidge and published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, now Harper Collins, as well as her two charitable funds supporting research by junior colleagues who study nutrition and mental health. Her primary goal is to influence the way mental health treatment is delivered. Dr. Kaplan, I know you have a presentation for us and I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. Well, thank you, Lindsay. I really appreciate the introduction and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you folks today. Um, this is my title slide and I've highlighted the one thing that I hope you will make note of uh, my website, which uses my middle initial, bonniejkaplan.com. It has a lot of different resources on it, other videotapes, other recordings, uh, other tips and so forth. And also, if you have a question for me, you can contact me through that website. It's conventional in my world to have a disclosure slide, and that's what this is. I want everyone to know that I have no commercial interests in any company or the sale of any product. But someone pointed out recently that I should mention that I am you know, promoting the sale of my book, The Better Brain, because of course I want to educate the general public, um, but you don't make money off of books actually. So it's not much of a conflict of interest. And anyway, it isn't my goal. It's my goal is to redesign the mental health treatment system more specifically uh, to redesign it um, and influence people to re redesign it so that when people go in to find help with a mental health challenge, they can expect to get the best treatment based on the best evidence base that is out there. That's true if you go in to have a broken leg fixed. It's true if you go to get medical care for something serious like arthritis or cancer you can assume that you are being given an evidence-based approach. In mental health, that is not true. You're getting pharmaceutically, um, drug company funded research base, but you're not being told about the other vast research base that is out there. And that is the goal of the book too. Now, just before I forget, I want you all to know that I know that there are many causes of mental health problems, not just suboptimal nutrition. We're not talking about those other causes today, but they're obviously all very important. But nutrition is the most overlooked one, I think, in terms of our society, which is funny because there it's probably got the oldest literature. Now, I'm going to start out by telling you a story. It's from the book, it's in our book, and it's not published uh, anywhere else, unlike almost everything else in the book is published in peer-reviewed articles and scientific journals. But this is the story of how I got to know about a little boy who we will call Liam. It's not his real name. So one day I went to answer the front door, and I was not surprised to see a man who I'll call Peter standing there with an envelope in his hand. Peter was providing some financial information and advice to my husband and me, and he had offered to drop off some papers. I invited him in for coffee, even though we barely knew each other, 
but I sensed that Peter was very, very tired. I did, did not need to probe very much. I just asked a simple question. Is work very overwhelming right now? And it kind of opened the floodgates. Peter was indeed stressed and tired, but not because of work. His home life was unraveling, and he did not know what to do about it. Peter and his wife had two children, a six-year-old boy and a four-year-old girl. The boy, who we're calling Liam, was having meltdown after meltdown after at home. Oddly, the school reported that he was a lovely, sweet child with no emotional problems. So this was a red flag, and but his parents, being fairly educated people, accepted that they must not be parenting as well as they should. So they took courses in child management. They participated in family therapy. They did everything. They read books. Nothing was working. On a typical day, Liam would come home from school having, now this is my editorial comment, I think kind of holding himself together to get through the school day and he would come home and have two or three major rage attacks uh, at the house. I asked about Liam's diet after explaining a bit about my research and I was somewhat surprised to find out that he was the opposite of a picky eater. They tried to give him a balanced diet and he would eat anything his parents prepared. Nevertheless, it seemed like it was, would be worth a try to give Liam some micronutrients. So the rest of the story is um, in the book and it tells how as a result of taking some micronutrients, minerals and vitamins, within 24 hours, um, Liam had basically stopped having meltdowns. And that was kind of ironic because the father had wanted to keep track. He wanted to count them as his son tried this new treatment. Uh, and, and it went from two or three per day to zero, and it has remained zero for several years. Um, they could see that he was not in control, like he would start to get worked up, and then he would gain control of himself. And this is something that we hear very, very often in children who have difficulty with mood dysregulation. Now, why did this make sense? I'm going to be talking to you about what the minerals and vitamins are, but first, I want to talk to you about what we know about the brain that would explain what sounds miraculous, like magic, um, so that you'll see it's not magic at all. It's really quite reasonable. Let's talk about the greediest organ in your body, and it is above your neck, your brain. Your brain accounts for only about 2% of your body weight, but it represents at least 20% of the metabolic demands. So it's this small organ with massive power requirements. What this means is that when I was a child growing up and I was told I had to eat well to, so I'd have strong bones and muscles, I think that's pretty much the way people are still taught. And it's, it's not that it's wrong. I mean, we all want good bones and muscles, you know, but why aren't we telling people, but especially you will be feeding your brain. Um, and that should be taught. So here's a little fact that a lot of people find very powerful. Each adult has four to six liters of blood. And so you would think, based on what I just told you about brain size, that about 2% of your blood would be in your brain at any given time. But in fact, it's more like 25%. Around one liter perfuses our brain every 60 seconds that our heart is beating. So that gives you an idea of how we have evolved this and you can see this intricate um, vasculature of the human brain in one corner of my slide and how we have evolved the need for so much blood and nutrients in addition to oxygen, of course, perfusing our brain for a reason. And this is the reason I wanna to talk to you about it. Um, metabolism is a, you know, we wrote our book for the lay public. And so whenever we used a, a word, we try to make it very understandable. And that's what I'm doing here. Even though I know many of the listeners to this talk already know a great deal about things like metabolism. Metabolism is the transformation of one compound to another. And it's the basis of human, a lot of human physiology. So suppose we have chemical A and we need it to be converted to chemical B. The way we get from A to B is usually an enzymatic reaction. But enzymes do not function alone. Enzymes need an abundant supply of cofactors, which are based on minerals and vitamins. And only then does that metabolic transformation 
move ahead in an efficient and at an, an efficient manner at an optimal speed. So I'm going to show you now the one side, it's in chapter two of our book in an even more simplified form, but it's the one side that everyone tells me has the biggest effect on them. It is the one that people tell me it influences how they eat and how they perceive everything that they put in their mouths. And I hope it has um, that impact on you. So this is a tiny, tiny corner of the tryptophan metabolism pathways, very much oversimplified. Three are put, three um, components are put in red only because the lay public knows the names tryptophan, serotonin, and melatonin. So I put them in red. And then a whole bunch of other chemicals here are, you don't need to worry what they are. And they're just showing you the different pathways for synthesis and breakdown of serotonin. So what you can do, every single arrow is an enzymatic reaction. And what you can do online is click on the arrows and ask the question, what cofactors are needed for optimal activity in this enzymatic step? And here you need three um, minerals. Here you need vitamin B6. Here you need two B vitamins and iron. Over here you need more B6 two B vitamins and a trace mineral called molybdenum. Here you need zinc and on and on it goes. The only way to have optimal function of the enzymatic pathways for the neurotransmitters in our brains, the only way is to make sure there is an abundant supply of micronutrients to make those pathways work well. The next slide is, uh, we're just going to glance at it, is to show you that this is not unique to serotonin. Here's dopamine. Um, my colleague at Oregon Health and Science University, Dr. Jenny Johnstone, drew this one in a circular manner, but it shows you the same thing. Every enzymatic step requires a lot of vitamins and minerals. And this is, I think, an important slide. I don't always take the time to, throw, to show it, but you know, um, the omega-3 fatty acids are very, very important, especially in the cell walls for structural integrity of neurons. And so people think just by eating flax, say, they're going to get, or, or fish oil, they're going to have plenty of EPA and DHA. But, you know, these are all um, metabolic steps that are required for omega-3 to get down to EPA and DHA. This slide also shows you omega-6 to arachidonic acid. And so what you can see, the enzymes that are relevant in each of these steps are again, completely dependent on vitamins and minerals to function optimally. So if you're trying to get your omega-3s out of flaxseed, you need to make sure you're getting plenty of the vitamins and minerals that are used in the metabolic transformation to EPA and DHA. So let's go back now to education, which is, I think, a major and important part of what I talk about today. We have been taught for years, we've been teaching people to eat a whole foods diet, what Dr. Andrew Weil years ago called a true food diet. Michael Pollan called it um, whole food diet, Mediterranean style diet. There are so many different names. The point is, it's real, actual fruits and vegetables. This is a Mediterranean style one. So it's fish a couple times a week. If you're not a vegetarian, meat, dairy and eggs, whole grains for your carbs, complex carbs, not refined carbs, which are just sugar, um, nuts and seeds to snack on, olive oil for your oil as much as you can. And then to save money, you must learn to cook. And if you cook with the beans and legumes that are shown in this slide, you'll save a lot of money. I'm going to mention that again later. But in spite of the fact that people have been taught this for decades now, this is how our society continues to eat. There is not a single whole food in this picture, and yet there are some people who rely on this kind of stuff, ultra-processed, for the majority of what goes into their mouths. Does it matter? Yes, take a look at the micronutrient content. Now, this is the busiest slide I have, but the good news is you don't need to read individual items. Let me show you what I'm trying to illustrate. 
This is ultra processed products. And this is a list of vitamins and minerals. And you can see that in ultra processed products, if this is 100% of the recommended dietary allowance, all of these are down at about 10% or less than 15% anyway. So crackers, white bread, soft drink, you're just not getting even the RDA of all of these minerals and vitamins. And then in contrast, this is a set of whole foods, same minerals and vitamins, again, 100% of RDA, but here you've got Brazil nuts and eggs and lentils and steak and salmon and so forth. So it's really important that people understand that when they rely upon ultra processed foods, they really are cheating their brains. And by the way, the RDA is, a, is such a trivial level. It's a very low bar. We'll come back to that. Now I want to tell you a little bit more about what's going on now. I think this is the most frightening information that I've seen for many years. It came from the US government data published in October and November of 2021. So just a few months ago, what it addressed was um, how Americans are eating. Now I want you to know that we have Canadian data too, but it's a little older and it's very consistent with this, but I'm showing you the American data because it's the most up to date. What they found is that in children, up to the age of 19, and this is a, um, a stratified random sample across the country, two thirds of the caloric intake that they were consuming was from ultra processed stuff. In other words, two thirds of what these children are putting in their mouths or what their parents are providing for them is practically devoid of minerals and vitamins, practically empty of the cofactors that are needed for their brains to work optimally. And the adults weren't much better. Approximately the same number. This is the NHANES survey, and I'll bet some of you are familiar with it. The National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which has been going on for 50 years. So the NHANES data showed that 57% of the adult food intake was ultra processed. So let's just say half of what our society is putting in their mouths has virtually no uh, micronutrients, minerals, and vitamins. Does this matter? Well, yes, nutrition is the foundation of our physical and mental resilience. That's been known for millennia. What happens to people whose nutrient intake is 50% of what it should and could be? Well, a lot of people don't know this, but there's actual research on that exact question. And it came from the University of Minnesota starvation experiments that were done right after World War II, where in this particular study, most of them were most of the studies were looking at physical health, but this one included measures of mental health. So 36 normal healthy men volunteered for a study in which for six months they would consume half of their normal caloric and nutrient intake. Now, immediately you should be saying, wait a minute, that doesn't relate to the way our people are eating. Our society is eating way more than 50% of what they need in the way of calories. And that is true. But what's important here is that they cut their micronutrient intake in half. So we can ask what happened to these people after six months. And what you see here basically with 1950s language is are, are all the um, uh, symptoms of depression, anxiety, uh, maybe some hypomania, social withdrawal, which goes across different things, and also some of the symptoms of ADHD, inability to concentrate. So we have known for 70 years, sorry, we have known for 70 years that when people cut their micronutrient intake, first of all, now we know um, what happens, which is that metabolic pathways become sluggish in their brains. But we have also known that that predicts the occurrence of depression, anxiety, et cetera. So <laughs> that's why I say it's such a horrible experiment we're doing at a huge societal level. And I think it is partly responsible for the horrifying prevalence of mental disorders right now. Sorry, I don't know why that one went away. Here we go. So this is data on prevalence of mental disorders going way, way back a few hundred years, less than 1%. 
maybe in 1960, still less than 1%. And now, and you know, this is in my lifetime, maybe for some of you too. Now, according to the World, World Health Organization, it's over 20%. And that's just the point prevalence. That's 20% at any given point in time. But according to the WHO, the lifetime prevalence is 50%. That means half of us will end up at some point with a diagnosis of a mental disorder at some time in our lives, which is crazy. I mean, you have to think then something is going on in our environment. I think the food environment is a big part of that. Now, let me try to convince you of the importance of nutrition by giving you an overview of the evidence. And I'm selecting some things so that I have time to talk about a few um, without you know, going into all the detail of all of them. That's what's in our book, really. But it's all written with a lot of stories and anecdotes. So I don't think people get bored. But I'm going to try to keep it down to about 15 minutes. So first of all, correlational data. I'm not even going to show you a slide. I'm just going to summarize it for you. There are more than a dozen correlational studies, probably more than 15 now, correlational studies from around the world, Finland, Spain, Australia, Japan, um, Canada, for some reason, not the US that I know of, but all of them asking the question of whether people who eat a more, let's call it a whole foods, Mediterranean style diet, whether they their mental health is different from people who eat a lot of the ultra processed stuff. And the answer for all of them is the same thing. We can stop doing these studies. They all find the same thing. People who eat, uh, and some of these studies are large population studies with thousands of people. The people who eat a more whole foods diet have fewer symptoms of depression and anxiety than the people who eat ultra processed food a lot and they have more symptoms of depression and anxiety. Correlational data, done. But you cannot conclude what's, what the cause is from correlational data. To prove causality, we need prospective longitudinal studies. And that's where you take a group of people who don't have a mental health problem and you characterize their diet and you ask if we, you, you can prospectively predict risk for a mental health problem. And the other type is treatment studies. Can you make symptoms go away with micronutrient treatment? So I'm gonna give you some samples of those two things. So this is the first one, which is prospective longitudinal study and to determine the direction of causality. And I'm showing you one in children. It's a Canadian study and it was published in pediatrics, which is the major um, pediatric journal for the American Pediatric Society. So a high prestigious journal. You can take a, take a look at the article if you want. Um, but I like teaching about this for a couple of, re or using this study for teaching for a couple of reasons. One is, you know, what are we doing to our children? <laughs> we really need to pay attention to what's happening to our children who we're not instilling proper habits in, unfortunately, in terms of diet. And secondly, because this study included not just food, but also screen time and physical activity, all lifestyle variables are very important. So what they did is they had about 3,400 children and they were divided according to how many of nine health recommendations they met. You can guess what they were. The six of them were dietary. And so it was like, you know, do you um, uh, drink uh, water instead of sugary drinks? Um, and other things related to fruits and vegetables and so forth. The other three were screen time and physical activity. And then because in Canada, we have administrative health data and a single payer user system where we can access that data to answer scientific questions, the research team went back and asked the question, could they predict just two years later, which of the children would end up being referred to a physician for diagnosis and treatment of a mental health challenge? And the answer was yes. So here's the result. And it's uh, this is kind of cartoon format that the investigators pro uh, actually provided for me. And what this shows is that the mental health services were rarely accessed by people who met at least five or six of the recommendations out of the six dietary ones. 
They were also not used as often in those who met three or four. The people who were in fact not following any of the dietary recommendations or just scoring a one or a two, they had a much higher risk of being referred for mental health problems. And then they did a really important analysis. They did a multiple regression analysis to determine um, how much each recommendation contributed to a physician visit. And they found every additional recommendation that was met was associated with 15% fewer physician visits for a mental health challenge. Think about the reduced suffering and, and suffering of entire families and think of the cost savings. If people were careful about getting their children to meet all nine of the recommendations, both dietary and minimizing screen time and increasing exercise, et cetera. It's a very powerful study. Now we went over correlational. I showed you just one prospective longitudinal study, but there are others from around the world. There are maybe a half a dozen of those, but there are dozens upon dozens of treatment studies. So I want to go into that in more detail. They fall into two types, whole of diet, meaning where you change the dietary intake of a person and micronutrients in pill form. So what do we know from whole of diet? Well, it's hard to change an entire diet. Um, this is the, uh, um, a summary of the only three studies um, that have done that. And I give you all the time, the first author, the journal, and the year, so you can look them up if you want. And they were done completely independently, completely independent groups, and they all found the same thing. So three studies all used adults with depression who at intake did not have a an outstanding whole foods diet, right? There was room for them to learn and to change. And they were randomized in every case. Now you cannot use a placebo. I don't know what a placebo for an entire diet would be. So <laughs> you can't do that, but you can use comparison groups. So they were randomized clinical trials where people either got education and guidance about diet or some kind of counseling or peer support. And what they all found was that even with depression, they, people were able to change their diets because that's something we often hear, oh, they, people don't have the energy when they're depressed. Well, if they're supported, they can learn. Those whose diets improved the most also, also showed the most improvement in mood. And this study, uh, one of the studies showed that about a third of those who received dietary counseling the people actually went into remission. They started out with a diagnosis of major depressive disorder. And after, I think it was 12 weeks in that study, um, they were eating better. They had no side effects, of course, because there are no side effects from eating better except good ones. And they no longer met criteria for major depressive disorder. And this same study, and this is the one by Jacka et al, was very interesting because it showed uh, it calculated the cost of food. Now, there's this myth out there that if you want to eat healthier food, it's going to cost you more money. That is not necessarily the case. It's true if you prefer lobster and steak, uh, you know, several nights a week, it will cost you more. But there are ways to save on your food budget. And that's what they prove. These people save 20% of their food budget. These are in Australian dollars. So prior to intervention and recommended diet. And of course, I'll talk again about how to do that, how to save money. Now, the last type of treatment is uh, pill form. There are reasons why just improving your diet might not be sufficient for optimal brain function. It's absolutely the place that everyone should start. Anyone interested in improving, in improving their mental health should first of all, get rid of all of the ultra processed chemical junk that's in the center of the grocery store and in all your convenience stores and in all your vending machines that are just packaged chemicals. And, um, and you know, except for the macronutrients, I mean, they do have carbs, but they're not the right carbs. They're not complex carbs. They're refined. They do have fats, but they're usually not the good fats. If they're a protein source, there might be a bit of protein in there, but they lack the minerals and vitamins that our brains need. 
And so um, even though <laughs> I, I say that it's not ideal, we should still be trying to eat more good whole foods. But there are two reasons why this might not be sufficient. The first one has to do with individual differences. So the amount of zinc that you need for optimal brain function might not be what I need for my optimal brain function. I might need more magnesium than you. Someone else might need more B12 than either one of us. These are inherited individualized needs that we know exist in physical health. And we've given a reference there of about 50 variations where people have inherited the need for an unusual amount of a cofactor for optimal function. We just haven't gotten those studies done yet for the human brain and for mental health. And by the way, there's a really important comment here. I know that there are lots of very good clinicians who do all kinds of tests on people. And obviously, um, you know, if your physician tells you you need a blood test and is watching for your calcium levels, your vitamin D levels, there's good reason to do that. But you have to understand that none of those tests, no existing test evaluates what you're getting relative to what your brain needs because we have no way of knowing what your brain needs. So what did I say? You might need more zinc than me. There's no test that would enable me to figure that out in a living brain. And the second thing that I don't have time to talk about, but is a huge issue, and that is we have to support our farmers uh, and food producers who are focusing on regenerative agriculture and replenishing the soil with the microbiome that the soil deserves. We have a half a chapter on the soil microbiome in our book, uh, if you're interested in looking at that further. So back to this, um, type of treatment using nutrients in, as supplements or pill form. Now you can, un, you know this, there is no magic bullet. If somebody says to you, oh, you have depression, take vitamin D. I hear that's gonna fix depression. You should be very skeptical because you've seen some metabolic pathways. And you, I mean, there was no pathway that I showed you that needed just a single nutrient. Our brain is way more complex than that. We need all of the nutrients in balance. So this is a little summary, again, of the different kinds of research. There are dozens and dozens of studies on single nutrients, studying one at a time, going back to the 1920s. Can you believe it? And I mean, they all found hints here and there, of possible improvements, but just ignore any study on a single nutrient. There's, um, you know now why. They're just not going to have an impact. They're not going to resolve really uh, mental health issues. There is a body of literature also on what I call the favorite few. And sometimes they're kind of semi-random. It's because the investigators are looking at a particular pathway. Um, and they also have not been very useful. But there is one exception, and it's on B-complex. I'm going to show you that on the next slide. So we're going to come back to that, hold that thought. The area where, um, to me, it's not surprising in retrospect, where there's lots of clinical benefit been demonstrated in several dozen studies is on studies that look at the broad spectrum, who look at those metabolic pathways and say, wow, the brain benefits from having all of the micronutrients that, that we should be getting in a supplement at all times. How many should we be getting? Well, that's another story. We know that there should be roughly 25 to 30 minerals and vitamins in a really healthy crop. And so that's what those broad spectrum formulas include. But here's another argument for trying to get your nutrition from plant food. There are thousands of plant-based nutrients that are called phytonutrients most of which don't have names. We don't know what their function is yet. And you're not going to get them in broad spectrum formulas or any other kind of micronutrients in pill form. They, Mother Nature packages them in our uh, healthy crops along with the minerals and vitamins. And so that's another good reason to try to get as much as you can from your food supply. So I told you the next slide would be about B-complex. So let me just say a word about that. B vitamins are very important in brain health. 
And so there are a number of studies, at least eight randomized controlled tri trials that have shown that in general populations, not in people diagnosed with anxiety, depression, et cetera, we call those clinical samples, not in clinical samples, but general populations, that taking a B complex once a day improves resilience. And I'll be showing you one more slide on it, but it's a, an area that should not be neglected because it is, I mean, resilience is something we really want to improve during um, various kinds of trauma uh, following, um, you know, hurricanes or whatever, and during the pandemic. So let's talk about um, multi-nutrient placebo-controlled randomized trials. These are all of the ones that I know of as of now, I'm just going to show you three summary slides and all of them were prepared by my, the co-author um, from the Bre Better Brain, Julia Rutledge. She's just great for always synthesizing our studies and making summary slides. This is a summary of all the studies where they were using 25 or more um, minerals and vitamins. And you can see that studies picked people for aggression, autism, addiction, stress, et cetera all kinds of things. And by and large, um, the vast majority of the clinical trials have shown clinical benefit. That's what the plus sign means. But this is the important sentence on this slide. If you step back and look at all these participants who were selected because they met um, a DSM category criteria, set of criteria for the diagnosis of ADHD or, or a mood problem or whatever, it doesn't matter what the diagnosis was across all the diagnoses. The common theme was that emotion regulation improves when people take a broad spectrum formula. That means lowering irritability, managing anger, avoiding meltdowns like the Liam story I told you about, et cetera. This is a summary that showed that in three studies of people with ADHD. And again, this is the second one of Julia's uh, summary slides. Now, these are three placebo-controlled randomized trials, first in adults with ADHD, then two in children. The one with adults and the two in children, they all use the same outcome measure so we can compare across them. And it's the Clinical Global Index for Improvement, CGII, okay? This one was done by Julia and her group in New Zealand. And the blue shows that the number of responders when they broke the code at the end of the study was much higher in the micronutrient group than in the group that had gotten placebo. We always get really big placebo effects when we study these micronutrients in capsule form. And so that's 21% is not surprising. Then Julia and her colleagues did the same study in children with ADHD, also with broad spectrum formula, and again, showed pretty much the same thing. And then um, just in October, and so this one is not in our book because it came out after our book was published, a multi-center trial run by Dr. Jenny Johnstone, who I mentioned before from Oregon Health and Sciences. She worked with people at Ohio State University, and one university in Canada, University of Lethbridge. And across, looks across the three centers, um, she showed the same thing. 54% on micronutrients compared to 18% got, uh, had a placebo effect. But what doesn't show quite as clearly on this slide is that across all the studies, across all the measures, it was mood regulation that improved the most. So now I'm going to try to show you a four minute video. It doesn't matter that you cannot hear it because the text is on the slide completely. Now this is a boy who was in the multi-center trial from Oregon.
thought you might be interested in seeing one parent's report and notice the emphasis on the lack, I mean, the control, the self-regulation. This is just an interesting point, uh, but it it's really uh, bears telling. Um, in the previous study that Julia had done, they had a uh, some evidence that the kids who'd been in the micronutrient group grew more than in the kids who had been on placebo. So the MADI trial, they were very systematic and more carefully monitoring height. And they found that in just eight weeks, the children in the micronutrient group grew six mil millimeters more. If you convert that to what it would be on an annual basis, it's about 3.5 centimeters. So, you know, our children need vitamins and minerals back to those bones and muscles as well as height and as well as um, mental brain health. So I'm gonna make a bold evidence-based statement. With three placebo controlled RCTs, plus a whole bunch of case series within subject crossover reports from three countries, all obtaining the same results. And by the way, it takes only two placebo R controlled RCTs to get FDA approval of a drug. So this is strong evidence. Therefore, no child should be treated first with medication when presenting with meltdowns, ADHD, and emotion dysregulation. I'm not saying they should never be on medication, but it should not be the first step. First, feed their brains, teach them life skills and nutrition, improve their lifestyle, psychotherapy, strengthen social supports, and then broad spectrum micronutrients if needed. Medication has a place when needed to supplement these, but this would be a better mental health care system. So I do have uh, one last summary slide and that involves resilience, which we're all concerned about right now because of the pandemic. So I'm going to try to summarize this in a nutshell and we have a couple of summary articles that I can send to anyone who wants to read about it. Julia lives in Christchurch, New Zealand. She's on the faculty at University of Canterbury. They had massive earthquakes in 2010 and 2011. And she did some research with micronutrients and I'll show you the results in a moment. And then we had a flood here in Southern Alberta. So we replicated her results. And then there were mass, uh, mass murder, um, mass shootings in two mosques in New Zealand in 2019. And she did clinical monitoring of people. So this is the summary slide, which shows you how broad spectrum micronutrients um, have had an impact to help people overcome depression, anxiety, and stress. And that's what this is the measure of um, following these crises. So the black horizontal line is the clinical cutoff. You want to get people down into the normal stress level. But obviously, after the earthquake, um, they were quite high. And that what this shows is that in Julia's study post-earthquake, and she did several studies, but in this one, the people came down into the normal range in four to six weeks. The flood, which was, I thought we wouldn't replicate her results, but we did um, because we had only a single day crisis. They had five months of earthquakes. We had one flood. And we showed the same thing, that people randomized to get a broad spectrum micronutrient formula were in the normal range within four to six weeks. And then the same thing with the people who went through the mosque massacres, even though it was not a randomized controlled trial, it was clinical monitoring of people who chose to take micronutrients. It was exactly the same finding. But this line shows you what happens to, to people who chose conventional treatment or who were randomized. Um, actually, they were not randomized. They chose, in this case, conventional treatment as usual, medication. And this was the comparator to the earthquake. In the flood, we had a randomized group, people who were randomized to get just vitamin D, and they also did not get into the normal range. So we have a, accidentally, neither one of us ever thought we'd be studying um, crisis, uh, crisis kinds of problems post-trauma, but we have pretty strong evidence of the importance of micronutrients for resilience. So the rest of my minutes, I'm going to talk to you about some practical suggestions. You can find more on my website. For example, Canada's Food Guide, I think really it has a very smart 
uh, perspective right now, and that is half your plate should be veggies and fruit. Uh, something to keep in mind, if you don't buy it, you don't eat it. The problem is not so much what we're eating, but what we're buying, or it, unless it's the children who are not buying it, right? But you need to shop the outside aisles of the grocery store. And yes, you need to learn to cook or buy already cut up veggies if you need to. A lot of people who tell me that it's not that they don't like cooking, it's that they don't like the preparation. Well, you can buy a lot of the stuff already ready to uh, throw in the pot now. So if you're addicted to sugar, you need to eliminate all liquid sugar over a couple of weeks. Carbonated water can be a good transition. What, what can you say to clients, to, your, to yourself, to your family? Uh, sometimes it's hard to raise the topic. So I give clinicians this recommendation. Say there's increasing evidence that how we eat affects how we feel. Let's talk about your diet. And then these four questions are, these are not scored. There's no right or wrong answer, but it enables people to reflect and discuss where they might improve their diets. Um, eating fast foods, fruits, vegetables, sodas, and fish, fish, fish. Um, always be sure to, uh, you know, I studied vitamins and minerals and not omega-3s during my career, not because omega-3s are unimportant. They're very important for both hearts and brains, but you can't package them together. So I ended up studying just vitamins and minerals. What is the first step? This is a really important point. People will come to you no matter what kind of clinical practice you have or just your friends and say, what kind of diet should I try? Should I try a paleo diet, a ketogenic diet, a vegan diet, a gluten-free diet? And what, what Julie and I recommend in the book, I think makes a lot of sense in mental health, which is don't start there. I'm not saying you shouldn't eventually try it. I mean, I know people who've done very much better, that's bad English, but anyway, have done much better on a gluten-free diet. But these are restrictive diets. And for people who have not gotten off of the processed stuff, um, it's not the way to go because they won't, they won't do well. They won't um, be able to follow the rules. So first, teach people the importance of real food versus ultra-processed chemical products. And you usually do not need referral to a dietitian for just learning that distinction. And after they've cleaned up their diet, people might want to go on further and try paleo, ketogenic, uh, intermittent fasting, you name it, right? So once again, this is where you save a lot of money. Put in to a Google search uh, the words lentils. Maybe you have some spinach on hand. Say the word recipe and you'll have more than 5 million recipes in less than one second. They're not hard to make. They're very quick too. Two important footnotes. A good broad spectrum formula of minerals and vitamins at therapeutic doses, such as the ones that we studied uh, in, in all the studies that I've been reviewing will amplify the effect of psychiatric medications. So this is good news. So people use these broad spectrum formulas to be able to decrease their meds so that they have a lower dose and therefore fewer side effects of the psychiatric medication. So this is a good news phenomenon. There is lots of evidence that single nutrients boost the effect of, of uh, medications. This is not an off the wall idea. Um, it's going back to the 1990s, and there are lots of sources where people have shown that a healthier brain, basically, that's how I think of it, um, will respond to a lower dose of medication. Here are the two websites. The two broad spectrum formulas that have been studied the most in the world and which, form, um, which are reviewed in chapter 11, along with all the other formulas that have been studied in the world, but they're the ones with the most scientific evidence are made by truehope.com and hardynutritionals.com. None of us researchers that I've mentioned, Julia Rutledge, her group, Jenny Johnstone and her group, the people at Ohio State, University of Lethbridge or I, none of us is commercially affiliated with these companies. Um, this, I think I, I threw this into the talk because I, I just got this email a few days ago before, while I was getting this talk ready. And I found it really interesting. Uh, it was a man in Canada who emailed me and he wanted to help his daughter, 
um, because she was not recovering adequately from PTSD. And so um, after he was looking for a physician and we couldn't identify one in his area. So I told him about how both of these companies, True Hope and Hardy Nutritionals have product specialists who would work with uh, his daughter over the phone and help her figure out dose, et cetera. And he said the most interesting thing to me, I may have to get over my reluctance to trust the non-medical product specialists at these natural health product companies. And then he said, for the kind of advice that I feel I have every right to get from medical professionals. And I thought, isn't that true? We all have the right to get good nutritional evidence or advice from medical professionals, but it's not happening. And it's because of the lack of education. The second important footnotes is, uh, or important footnote, because I get asked this all the time, is people will say, well, what about, oh, I don't know, one a day vitamins or Centrum or whatever. Um, is there anything wrong with those? So here's my answer. There is nothing wrong with them, but there is no evidence of benefit for mental health problems, not even an anecdote. And it's probably because they are not broad spectrum. They're, they tend to be a, a smaller number of micronutrients, um, maybe 15 instead of 30 or something like that. And they tend to be a very, very low dose. And by low dose, I mean usually maybe 25% of the RDA, whereas the research formulas are above RDA, but they're well below the tolerable upper, upper levels. And there has not been, uh, there has never been a serious adverse event from them. So we're pretty confident about safety. This just illustrates, these are the over-the-counter supplements for B6. And these are all of those that have ever been used in a research study anywhere in the world as of 2014. And what this shows is the difference in dosage. So the research formulas that have shown mental health benefit are higher dose than over-the-counter. So just to conclude, I just want to remind you there are lots of videos on my website. Uh, Julia Rutledge has a wonderful TEDx talk. I think it's up to 3 million views now. I need to check that number. And also she's teaching a free um, MOOC, a mass online open course, uh, which has been watched uh, by thousands now with the lots of six minute videos. If, if you want to find it, you, it's called something like mental health and nutrition. But if you just go to edX.org and search for, put her name into the search field, you'll get it. And this is a four minute read about how micronutrients or lack of micronutrients may be influencing our angry rhetoric and lack of emotional self-control. So I guess I just want to say again that mental health treatment should be evidence-based, and it is not. It is only based on pharmaceutical drug evidence, sometimes on some exercise studies, but there is all this research on nutrition. I've barely scratched the surface, and facts do not cease to exist because they're ignored. So I urge you to educate yourselves more, and I think you'll be amazed to find out how much we know. And thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to some questions. <laughs>